So we'll now get started. Um, so hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to this presentation, which is part of an ongoing Goose webinar series uh, exploring issues and projects associated with global sustained ocean observing. My name is Albert Fisher. I'm the director of the Global Ocean Observing System Projects Office, which is headquartered at the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO here in Paris, and I'll be the moderator today. And during the next hour, we'll start with an approximately 30-minute presentation from Glenn Nolan, who is the Secretary General of Eurogoose, uh, one of our regional alliances of European institutions focused on operational oceanography uh, and a number of different regional ocean observing systems. So after Glenn's presentation, we'll conduct a question and answer session by chat. I'll moderate and select the questions verbally. You can see the chat window already open on your screen. So if you'd like to start asking clarifying questions during the presentation, please go ahead. Uh, this session is being recorded, and a link to the recording will be posted to the Goose website uh, after the webinar is over. And now I'll turn it over to Glenn for his presentation. OK, thank you very much, Albert. And uh, it's a pleasure to give this webinar today. Uh, as Albert mentioned, I have been working in Eurogoose since May of last year, 2015. Uh, as Secretary General there, and we've been uh, building up a capability in Eurogus over the last uh, over the last while to deal with various um, initiatives we're involved in. One of which is the European Ocean Observing System, which I'll talk about at the end of this presentation. So I'd just like to acknowledge my uh, my co-author here, Patrick Garnage, my uh, trusted uh, trusted sidekick, and uh, I'm uh, delighted that he's contributed some of the slides for this presentation as well. So without further ado. Um, this is what I'd like to talk about. I'll tell you a little bit about our organizational structure and our, our members, where, where they are geographically and so on. I'll talk about how we fit into the Goose system uh, as a, a data broker and some of the work that we've done on a global data portal. Um, third thing I'll talk about is how we work day to day. Our regional operational oceanographic systems, known as RUSES, our task teams, which focus on various measuring platform types and our working groups, which focus on areas such as data management, technology, and so on. Uh, and finally, I have a few slides on the European Ocean Observing System, which is a developing concept uh, that we've been working on for the last uh, several months. So we have 39 members uh, in 19 countries. You can see some of the logos there, I hope, on the slides in front of you. Um, and obviously, you have more time to look at this uh, webinar offline and uh, look in more detail at some of the material I'm probably going to have to rush through here due to the overall time constraints of, of the seminar. But as I say, we're representative of almost 40 agencies in 20 in 19 countries, um, and we're very well geographically spread around Europe. You can see just on the next slide a, a map of uh, the approximate locations of where all of our members are. We have 39 uh, core members, if you like, of Eurogoose, and we have an additional 60 members if you include the members of the regional operational oceanographic systems, our RUSES. So around 100 institutes are, are part of the Eurogoose uh, ecosystem, if you like, or the Eurogoose family. So uh, Luis Valdez in 2013 painted this very complex picture of the uh, European marine and maritime uh, landscape. Uh, he, he tried to map it onto the periodic table, uh, which is, I think, a, a very worthy uh, endeavor. And you can see, for example, some of the funding instruments there in that very bright green color, the Framework 7, Horizon 2020, and so on. Uh, you can see the regional conventions that govern a lot of what we do in the marine and maritime space, in, in Europe in particular, the OSPAR Convention, HELCOM, and so on. Um, you can see some of the major initiatives at European level, uh, or clusters, if you want to call them that, Eurocean, uh, Marbef, uh, GMES, which is now Copernicus. So we, we have this very, very complex uh, landscape. Um, we have other uh, data portals like ICES, IODE, OBIS, and so on. Apologies for all the acronyms. Um, and then similarly, you have other larger, more intergovernmental initiatives like JCOM, Plyvar, Goose, and so on. So it's a very, very complex landscape. I just used this slide to emphasize the complexity. So Eurogoose is one of, uh, I think, 13 uh, Goose regional alliances around the globe. You can see us there in the upper left-hand panel. So we are part of the global jigsaw that makes up the global ocean observing system, um, focused on the European seas primarily and an overlap with the uh, Mediterranean as well. Um, 
we in recent times tried to um, one of the things that we've been involved in is to pull together an inventory of all of the operational forecast models uh, in in the world pretty much and uh, I encourage you to go on to the uh, Eurogoose website and look at this you can get a lot more detail than I can show you in a a static slide, um, but you can see every single forecast model for every part of the global ocean where where one exists. And um, there are very few gaps in this inventory. But obviously, if you're if you're aware of any, please uh, please let us know. And um, just to draw your attention to that, you can find out more information about each individual model by clicking on the respective polygons and learning more about the uh, the models that are in operation in different places. And one of the things you'll see is a very dense network of forecast models. Uh, in places like the Mediterranean Sea, around the US and other places like that. So please, if you have time, take, take a look at this uh, model inventory. So the one of the major roles that we play is as a, a, a data broker. Um, and I have a, a plot here from the Baltic Sea, which is uh, from 1999, uh, where a ha literally a handful of water level stations were shared among the, uh, the ocean forecasting and ocean observing community. And due to much of the work that Eurogoose has done with the regional systems and so on, this has expanded considerably over the last uh, 15, 16 years. Um, there's the EMODnet initiative, the European Marine Observations and Data Network Initiative, and you can see a whole host of additional dots that are now on, on the map that cover uh, the, the Baltic, the Atlantic, the Mediterranean, and so on. Uh, so we have a much more comprehensive set of variables that are gathered and shared on a on a you know, more or less an hour by hour basis between uh, institutes and among institutes. So it's, we've come a long way since since the late 90s. Uh, you can see initiatives in the US, the IUS uh, systems, Danko Willis and our colleagues there have built a formidable system in the US. Uh, and again, all of the, those data are available uh, in real time in most instances for decision support and so on. There's a very comprehensive network in Australia. This is a snapshot of the Australian Ocean Data Network portal. Uh, that Tim Maltman and his colleagues there uh, have, have done incredible work to, to build and to gather all those observations. You have an Indian Ocean system as well, uh, comprised of many, many different types of platforms. Uh, you have the Argo system, which uh, JCOM, JCOM Ops in Brest manage on behalf of the Goose and WMO communities, which are all the profiling floats in the ocean. And uh, as I say, we fit into this overall GRA structure. And this is an attempt at a global portal that we've uh, been working on in Eurogoose with our EMODnet colleagues. This is basically to amalgamate all of the uh, data resources from around the uh, global system into a single portal. So this has been done on a pilot basis. Uh, it was shared among the Goose Regional Alliances uh, at a meeting last September. And everybody likes this idea of having a single stop off point for for marine data for the globe. So this is work in progress, but just to show you some of the uh, progress that has been made since that first plot I showed you in the Baltic in the late 90s when literally a handful of stations were being exchanged. So uh, this, I can glance over this, but we're in the process of expanding our membership to make sure we have the correct geographic uh, coverage within Eurogoose. Um, and we want to also encourage some of our Roos members, our regional system members to become members of Eurogoose. We also want to build links to the, to the private sector um, we work very closely with the different DGs of the uh, European Commission, most notably DG Mare, DG Grow, and DG Research. Um, we work very, very well with the European Environment Agency, the Marine Board, with ICES, European Maritime Safety Agency, and the Coper Copernicus Marine Service, or CMEMS, as it's known as now. And together, we help define priorities in operational oceanography in Europe, and we try to coordinate that activity with the rest of the world. So we have a strategy that covers the period between 2014 and 2020 with five key areas that we're hoping to promote uh, to identify the strategic priorities for the system, to promote the system where possible, to uh, cooperate with our, our neighbours, uh, to co-produce uh, products and services for end users and to work towards uh, expanding the number of products that are available and fundamentally to sustain the observing system. And I'll talk about that in the context of the European Ocean Observing System in a few minutes. So from the strategy, we have an implementation plan. Uh, from that, we have annual work plans. And then that work is distributed between the Eurogoose office, which is here in, in Brussels, where I am today. We uh, distribute some of the work to our working groups and our task teams and our regional systems, which you can see there in the, in the, in the map. And we update our implementation plan on a, on a 
a quarterly basis and we do a major update every about once a year. So this is our, our governance structure, if you like. Um, we have a general assembly, which is made up of usually one representative of each of our members. So we have an executive director's board, which is a subset of that. That's the green box as you work your way down through this uh, structure. Uh, I, I, as I said, play the role of uh, secretary general. I have an office support team of uh, Patrick Garange, Dina Eprakina, and Vicente Fernandez. Our chairman, Eric Book, uh, is also very active in the day-to-day -day operations of the office. We then have five regional uh, operational oceanographic systems uh, in blue boxes here, the Arctic, the Baltic, known as BUS, the Ibirus area, which is Iberia, Biscay, Ireland. We have the Northwest Shelf, which is known as NUS, and we have Mongoose, which covers the Mediterranean and is a, a merge of the previous Moon and Medgoose uh, entities into a single entity called Mongoose. We have five working groups uh, in the green box there, the cross-cutting box that you can see there, We've one on science advisory, one on technology planning, one on data exchange, data management, one on coastal modeling, and one on products, product development. In more recent times, we've established six task teams, which are in the yellow box, one for uh, HF radars, for surface currents primarily, uh, one for tide gauges, one for ferry boxes, which are automated systems on board ferries, one for gliders, uh, one for moored uh, platforms or fixed platforms, if you want to call them that. And Euro Argo has a, a special status within all this uh, in that they already are a legal entity of their own, um, but they are part of the Euro Goose family as well. Uh, and we also have a, a marine mammals uh, task team that's in development at the moment and will hopefully go for sign off from our membership at our annual meeting in May. So this is just an overview of, our, of the governance structure in, in the organization. Um, just to give you a sense of, of some, some of the areas where we work in terms of nationally, regionally, pan-European and global, um, you can see, and again, this is a slide that you should probably pour over in more detail afterwards if you have time, um, but you can see at the national level, we try to create new opportunities and foster collaboration, shared infrastructures, improved interfaces with policymakers. Uh, we try to keep tuned in to regional EU and global policies. We try to support young researchers. Uh, we try to enhance the communication and dissemination. Uh, you can see at the regional level, we have our roots data portals, uh, operational services and data collection. We try also to scan the landscape for trends, gaps and priorities. We try to support the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, the MSFD. We try to enhance the visibility of the organization and our members uh, across the regions. At the pan-European level then, we are trying to build the European Ocean Observing System, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, we are very focused on unlocking access to uh, data sets that exist at the national level and aren't shared at the European level for, for one reason or another. We try to get to the bottom of those um, blockages, uh, barriers to release of data and try to, um, try to free up those data so as many people as possible have access to data. We have a very public and open uh, data policy. At the global level then, we work with Goose to help define the EOVs. We're, uh, becoming active in some of the goose panels for biology, for biogeochemistry, and for physics. Um, we try to build capacity in other regions that aren't as well developed as the European region. We try to promote European leadership uh, in, in research, science, and technology. And we work very closely with our colleagues in IUS in America, IMOS in Australia, and the goose office in Paris, where Arbeth and his colleagues are. So that's a very quick run through some of the some of the things that we work on, and I apologize that I can't spend more time on that. Um, this is a very nice slide that Patrick prepared uh, just on the whole idea of data sharing and why it's important. Uh, Maori, back in the 1850s, um, was convinced that ad adequate scientific knowledge of the sea could only be obtained by collaborating and by international cooperation. He, he hosted a conference in 1853 and persuaded many people from around the world to share their data. Um, the observations were evaluated and the results were given a, a worldwide distribution. Um, so this really was a precursor for some of the major data sharing that took place, uh, started really over a century later. Um, so maybe Maori is one of the one of the godfathers of open open data access, and we should uh, we should pay due due attention to that. Um, the, the European landscape for data management is is quite complicated. Marine data management. Uh, there are three initiatives at European level. One that is led by DG Growth. These are, these are, if you like, government departments within the EC. So DG Growth is one government division, if you like, uh, focused on growth and jobs. Copernicus uh, sits within that DG Growth. 
You have C Data Net, another initiative that uh, sits within the Research and Innovation Directorate of the European Commission. And you also have EMODnet, which I mentioned earlier, that sits within the Maritime Affairs and Fisheries Division. Uh, and Eurogoose has an integrating role in all of these. It's, it, it, has, it has its fingers in each of these three pies and it helps to integrate the activities across these three uh, complex initiatives. So maybe just to show that in a, in a slightly different way, um, you have the, on the next slide, you have the, the uh, data gathering platforms in the upper left-hand panel, uh, which has a, a JCOM flag on it. Um, those data are fed to a number of places. Um, they're fed to uh, the National Oceanographic Data Centers in each country, the NODCs. They're fed to EMODnet, to the physics portal of EMODnet. And they're also fed to what they call the, the in situ thematic assembly center, which is that INSTEC you see, which is a component part of the Copernicus Marine Service. So again, apologies for the acronyms, but this uh, it's very hard to, to um, avoid the acronyms, unfortunately, in, uh, in, in European oceanography or global oceanography. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's riddled with, with acronyms. The role that we play here is that, is that blue arrow that you see between Nemo Net Physics and the in situ tax with the owners of the observations at national level. We spend a lot of time unlocking various data sets making sure that they flow to the in-situ thematic assembly center, that they flow to EMODnet physics, and that they flow to CDataNet as well. So that's one of the key data broker roles that we play in Eurogoose, so that the data are available to end users. So Patrick has very eloquently summed up this uh, complex system that we have in Europe, where you have the regional systems, you have some of the data that goes into the in-situ thematic assembly center that I mentioned earlier on, that is used primarily to feed the operational forecast models, uh, in the Copernicus service. The next uh, major uh, destination, if you like, for, for European data that's collected uh, is EMODnet physics or the various EMODnet lots that are funded by DG Maritime Affairs. And the final uh, area is that of the National Oceanographic Data Centers um, where data are put in long-term archives. So a lot of the very historical data sit in the National Oceanographic Data Centers. And we play a role there in making sure that our ruses give their data to the National Oceanographic Data Centers and that these are fed on to the, to the global system and that they're available uh, to users, which is the most important thing, available to end users. So how does that sit within the global system then? You have a, a box on the next slide that uh, summarizes the previous slide, but then we also feed into the Goose uh, system. Uh, we feed into the WMO system, the, uh, what was formerly called the WIS. WMO information system and we also feed directly to agencies like the European Environment Agency and the European Maritime Safety Agency and this is not an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination but it just gives you a flavor for how we feed from the local level to the global level. So we mentioned the the uh, the, the growth in data sets over the last while I think this is a duplicate slide so I'll, I'll run through this very quickly uh, apologies for that there are portals for everything and we're one of the Key jobs is to try and integrate some of these uh, portals. So I'm just going to talk pretty quickly about our, our regional operational oceanographic systems with a, an eye to the time here. Um, we have 60 of these uh, on, on top of the 39 Eurogoose partners. You can see the five regional systems as they're configured on that, uh, the, on that yellow uh, map that you can see on the slide. Um, and each of these regional systems has their own data portal that feeds into the initiatives that I previously described. So each one has a data portal. There's one for the Northwest Shelf, for the Baltic, for the Arctic, uh, for the Mediterranean, and for the Iberia Biscay Ireland area. So again, I'd encourage you to go and have a look at some of these portals if you're interested in data from these regions, or you're even interested in the technical development of some of these portals, because there's some very nice technology employed. We also have five working groups, uh, which I'm not going to have a huge amount of time to go into. We want a data management and, and the quality of data, science advisory, technology planning, products working group, and a coastal modeling working group. Just to give a very high level uh, description of what they do, uh, the technology working group identifies existing technology that's available to support operational oceanography. Uh, it also tries to identify new technology under development and needed by our community and tries to identify gaps in technology so that we can, we can figure out what innovations need to take place um, for the future observing system. The products working group uh, tries to make products that support marine policy development and implementation. One of the key areas is the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, MSFD. 
Uh, we also get feedback from key users on the utility of some of the products that our members uh, make and produce. And uh, we also try to make sure that these products are more broadly available for policy implementation or as the evidence base for, for new, new policies. Our data management working group uh, is very active in trying to integrate the activities of uh, Copernicus, eModNet and CDataNet. Uh, one of the things that we are trying to do at the moment is to have an aggregated uh, historical in situ data set that provides the best copy of, of the parameters recorded. And this has quite uh, immense implications for climate studies because we want the best possible data of the best possible quality available for, for climate studies. And we need to make sure that duplication between the services is minimized. So the data mech working group, as we call it, works on some of these duplication issues and improving interaction and so on. We have a science advisory working group that basically is working on uh, setting the research priorities for the Eurogoose community over the next, uh, the next decade or so. Um, and the, some of that is based on the modeling system, some on the observing system. Uh, again, something to look at afterwards really more than anything else. We have a coastal modeling working group uh, that links very strongly with Gode Ocean View, which is a, a pretty well-known global initiative. Um, they look at uh, things like downscaling, upscaling, uh, data assimilation, common protocols, and so on. Again, I have to race through these slides, unfortunately. I, I want to give you a general sense of what the Eurogoose task teams do. Um, there are operational networks of observing platforms, and we have six of these, as I mentioned, at the start of the start of the presentation. Um, the main job terms of reference are kind of common across the task teams, but it's to coordinate the existing efforts um, of the individual observing community uh, entities, uh, provide an up-to-date picture of the platforms in Europe, facilitate uh, common data procedures and protocols, foster scientific and technical developments and joint programs, and ensure that the data are delivered to the Roost data portals. So that, that's in essence what a task team does. I don't have time to go through them all. We have a HF radar one there that's chaired by Azti Technalia in Spain. Uh, I don't really have, have time to go into the detail of what they what they do, but there is information on our website. It feeds into the global system. The Group on Earth Observations have a high frequency radar uh, group. We have one on uh, tide gauges, which is chaired by Puertos del Estado in Spain. Um, again, very similar in terms of reference across all of these uh, task teams. Um, we have we have one on ferry boxes, which are these automated systems for ferries, which is headed by Franciscus Colline and Willy Peterson and HZG in Germany with members from all over Europe. Um, we have another one on gliders, which is a merge of some of the existing uh, activities like Groom and the Ego, uh, which some of the glider community would be familiar with. And we're developing uh, task teams for, uh, for fixed platforms, for moorings, and for, for mammals over the next couple of years. So I'm going to race through these slides very quickly, unfortunately. Um, EuroWargo is there. It's a very well-established um, system already. Um, so I, I don't really need to say much more about EuroWargo. And as I say, we have a marine mammals task team that's under development. This is to tag seals and other marine mammals with oceanographic sensors. And they go to some very interesting places in the world ocean that are typically quite data sparse. So we're very interested in developing this task team over the next uh, few months. So the benefits of being a task team under Eurogoose, you become part of a larger community. It's a permanent structure. It isn't just a project. Um, it may be a, a route into new project funding, um, sitting within a more permanent structure, helps to raise awareness of the activities. Our office has a communications function here and we can help with some of the promotion of the activity uh, and you can link to initiatives on the local, regional and global scales, potentially attract funding and uh, you know more widely make your task team visible under Eurogoose. These are just some of the projects that we're involved in, Envery Plus, Atlantis, Jericho Next. We work very closely with JPI Oceans, Euro Argo, Copernicus and so on, just to give you a flavor of some of our partners. I want to talk for the last few minutes of the presentation about the European Ocean Observing System, which is an initiative we've been working on for the last uh, maybe nine or 10 months. Uh, so this is just a brief description of what I'm gonna talk about with uh, with EUS. Um, I'm gonna have to really race through this because I have far too many slides. This is the operational oceanography landscape um, as we see it, observations, processing and modeling, and then services to end users. It maps very neatly onto what the joint programming initiative for oceans 
uh, have in their uh, strategic research and innovation agenda to observe, forecast, map, and reduce risk in the oceans. So we're on, on the same page as many of the other the other uh, European initiatives. We have um, at the moment today in Europe we have many national systems that are partially coordinated through Eurogus. We have some research infrastructures, and we have Imodnet and Copernicus uh, Marine Service as major integrators of some of the data sets that exist. But we have major spatial gaps, we have major temporal gaps major parameter gaps in terms of biogeochemistry and long-term commitments. It's worth saying that about 70% of the dots on the map that I showed you earlier are based on short-term research funding. So we need a strategy that allows us to sustain the observing system over time. EUS has been mentioned in various policy documents over the last uh, several years, uh, various uh, joint papers with the Marine Board and Eurogoose, the Ostend Declaration, Marine Research Infrastructures Report and so on. So uh, we want to now put it into action uh, following the Rome Declaration of 2014. To that end, we had a brainstorming workshop in 2015, May 2015, with 20 observing system experts to define the, the purpose, the definition, the scope, and so on for use. These are some of the drivers in terms of research, societal uh, benefits, uh, technology uh, drivers, environmental drivers, and so on. We have a, a kind of working definition of the use that it's a sustained and integrated observing system for Europe seas in order to understand the current state and key processes that underpin the sustainable management of marine resources. The other two definitions that you see there are variations of the same theme. So it gives you a sense of what we what we mean by use when we say it. Just in terms of the geographic scope, uh, there's a red polygon on the map there that shows the scope of the Atlantis project that Martin Visbeck uh, coordinates. The EUS project has a slightly different scope. We have to take in all the European uh, regional seas, but we also have to take in some of the uh, the islands that are the, the the territorial areas of the mem European member states in the Caribbean, for example. So it gives you a sense of the difference in scope. We also take in the Mediterranean and Black Sea, the Baltic, which are outside the scope of Atlantis, the Atlantis project, which I think Martin Bisbeck will talk about at a future seminar. So the drivers for reuse are, suffice to say, are uh, plentiful uh, and a very, very easy to make a, a case for, for use on the basis of, of drivers and I won't, I won't go into detail there. Stakeholder landscape for use is, is very detailed. These, this is just a flavor of some of the stakeholders for use. Uh, Goose and JCOM, the uh, International Ocean Data Exchange, Eurogoose. You see, I'm sure, programs that you recognize here, uh, the carbon programs, the ocean data portal, the research vessel operators. What I've tried to do here is split between institutions, legal entities, programs, and projects. So again, it's a slide for a, a bit of perusal after offline, if you like, after this seminar, because it is quite quite complicated. It's just to give a sense of, of some of the stakeholders. Uh, and obviously, if we're not serving end users, the whole thing is, is, isn't is uh, worth, uh, worth pursuing. So it's very important that we do that. Um, just in terms of a structure for, for use, um, there is that underlying data and cyber infrastructure that we tried so hard to build over the last few years, and I spent a reasonable amount of the earlier parts of the talk focusing on that. So that generates basic scientific knowledge and innovation. It allows things like ocean literacy to take place, citizen science, but it also provides the evidence base for policy uh, and such directives as the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, the Common Fisheries Policy, Marine Spatial Planning. On the other side, you have these major data integrators, uh, Copernicus Marine Service, Emodnet, and they provide information for uh, gro blue growth and uh, companies and entities that depend on marine information for blue growth. What we'd like to do as part of EUS is optimize and standardize a little bit the systems that are out there, look at some of the gaps, look at some of the alignment and integration issues, look at capacity building in a bit of detail. And through a steering group and a forum, we will we hope to achieve that over the next while. We hope to look at things like multidisciplinary science, biogeochemical monitoring, uh, value for money overall in the overall observing system. That's very important. We believe that if we do this in the right way, it will provide a common voice for European ocean observing and demonstrate very strong leadership for Europe in ocean observing. But obviously, all of this requires long-term funding. So we need to figure out a way to fund all of these activities long-term. So uh, the proposed way ahead, I might just go through some of the initiatives that we have. I'll, I'll skip over this proposed way ahead slide because I covered it later on. Just in terms of governance, we have a steering group uh, agreed, an advisory board, which will be independent advisors who, who guide on the overall direction that EU takes. And we'll have a planning and implementation group on the lower left-hand side of this diagram, 
which will be comprised of our regional systems, task teams, working groups, and member states. We'll have member state uh, representation on the planning and implementation group. And we also have maybe ad hoc working groups on uh, data strategy and availability and so on. So it's just to give you a high level sense of what we're about. In terms of governance and policy, we've, we've actually aligned some of the existing initiatives with this already. We've identified some steering group members. We collaborate with the Marine Board, ICES and JPI. In the upper right hand side, um, looking at the requirements for the system, we, there are activities within Goose, the Framework for Ocean Observing, Atlantis, the European Environment Agency, within Copernicus, within our Rooses. Um, in terms of gap analysis, there's a lot of activity again within the Atlantis project, within the Jericho project, within DG Mare's sea base and checkpoints, within the EmoNet human activities uh, portal. And in terms of the observing system status and readiness, Eurogoose and Goose do a lot of mapping activity on this. There's activity within Atlantis, Jericho, EmoNet, and EEA. So there's a lot of uh, work already that we can build upon. In terms of unlocking valuable uh, data sets, um, we work on that through EmoNet physics, through our regional systems, and through work that Patrick Gorringe and our team does on a daily basis to unlock some of the data sets that are out there but not, not routinely available. We hope to have some pilot demonstrations of the benefits of the observing system through Atlantis and through the Eurogoose members. It's also planned in some of the recent Horizon 2020 calls. Um, we have a, a fairly active communication role for EUS at the moment. Um, we have a logo that uh, will be approved shortly. The web page will be put out pretty soon. And we hope to have an event in the European Parliament later this year. And just in terms of defining gaps in the bathymetric mapping, because bathymetry and observing systems and modeling go hand in hand. We have various initiatives there through European Commission Seabed Mapping Working Group and other initiatives like that. So the progress to date, we have our, our website is designed, the logo is ready to go. We have a domain reserved and we've presented it in the various places you can see there. And we also hope to be involved in a joint working group with the, with the European Marine Board on the biological aspects of the European Ocean Observing System. So that's a very swift run through the Eurogoose activity. Uh, I hope I haven't gone through it too quickly and I hope you learned something and I'm happy to field any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thanks so much, Glenn. Really appreciate your talk. Uh, you did really cover a very uh, complicated landscape and, uh, and two different uh, constructs as well, Eurogoose and, and EUs. And actually, first question is a good question. It's from Katie Hill. And uh, can you explain to us the difference between EUs and Eurogoose in terms of goals? Is EUs uh, more dis multidisciplinary? Is it more of a development activity? What was the reason that a different construct was uh, created? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a very good question, and it's, I'd, I'd be lying if I said it was the first time I, I was asked the question. It's, it's, a, it's a key question. Um, EUS is, is broader than, than Eurogoose. So Eurogoose historically has been very focused on, uh, on the physical variables, you know, on things like waves, currents, temperature, salinity, and so on. EUS has to be much more than that. If it is going to provide for the sustainable management of fisheries and answer various things with directives, uh, it, it has to bring in our colleagues in the biological community. So we're reaching out to uh, entities like ICES, um, like EMBRC, uh, through our colleagues in the Marine Board, to make uh, the EUs much broader than what Eurogoose is. But the, um, and, and to also to operationalize some of the biological elements, because a lot of them are at a lower technology readiness level than uh, some of the physical measurements. So EUs is hoping to bring along a lot of the biological uh, variables to make them more operational and to make them part of the overall uh, European Ocean Observing System. So a little broader than what Eurogoose does, which is very... And so is the vision that uh, Eurogoose would remain as an uh, operational oceanography, so physical sort of marine services component of an EUs? Yes, I guess that's that's one way to put it. I mean, EUs will be much broader than Eurogoose with representation from, uh, as I say, some of the other bigger biological entities and so on. Um, you, you know, Eurogoose still has a, has a very strong mandate to de deliver products and services, but I think you see an evolution in some of those products and services to reflect more biological products as well as the physical products that we do now. So I think Eurogoose will remain, but we'll 
we'll play the role of operationalizing uh, some of the biological activity. That's so our question focus a little bit on requirements and connecting um, to users from Jim Baker. Uh, can you give us some examples, and let's talk about Eurogoose in this case, what, uh, what actual products that you're helping to provide for users? Through our through our members, through our, our thirty nine members and the sixty additional members in the Russes, uh, you know those members are completely uh, in tune and in touch with the users at the local level, you know, on the beach, so to speak. So uh, there are many different types of products that that are produced by the Eurogoose members, um, you know, from maritime safety applications, you know, in the vicinity of of harbors, uh, to products related to fulfilling requirements under some of the European directives. So to look at trends in sea surface temperature or trends in salinity. Um, we have wave forecast products, probably 80% of the products I would say across all the Eurogoose members have a focus on waves and, and sea state and planning activities in uh, the ocean around um, around the sea state and, and ocean weather, if you like. So that's a, that's a very big uh, user base. Um, and they they would be the main ones. So some related to directives, some related to maritime safety, uh, and then bear in mind also that a lot of the archive data then become the basis for some of the climate products that are developed within uh, the Copernicus Marine Service and various reanalysis products that are out there in in Good A as well. So we we feed into that process. Too. And is there a is there a formalized process in your goose to connect to your user communities, uh, or does it really happen at the more local level through the institutions through the regional ocean observing systems to, to really identify and catalog requirements uh, for your goose as a whole, or does that really stay at the roost level? To be honest, it, it, it is primarily done at, at the Roos level. The, the Rooses are the, are the experts and the individual institutes are the, are the experts. And I think when you when you do any kind of work with, with, with users and, and you, you have a scientist set of assumptions about what a user needs, um, a, a user is usually very quick to tell you that your, your assumptions are incorrect and that you need to revise uh, how you think. I certainly had many experiences like that with uh, shellfish farmers and with uh, search and rescue operators in my previous life when I worked in, in, in Ireland. Um, you, you know, you think you know what the users want, but you actually really need to go and talk to them and you need to, it's an iterative process. Um, you have to really be, um, you know, have an active dialogue with them. You shouldn't second guess what they need. Um, you really need to go back and forth. And one of our members, the Institute of Hydrography in, in Portugal has has literally gone to the, the the step of, you know, being being on being on the beach talking to the various people who who, who need the, the products and services, uh, to develop them in in the right way for the say the leisure community or for uh, maritime transport or or whatever it is. And you really need to be down at that level. And that isn't a role that um, any kind of centralized attempt to to gain um, user user feedback or to understand users. You know, done either through old projects like My Ocean and Mercy. It, it's quite challenging to get user requirements in, through those types of fora. It's much um, more direct to go through member institutes and national institutes that that have a. And is there a fora in in your I know that you you don't have a working group that's focused on the connection to users, but do you have other fora within your to share those experiences so that the different institutions and ruses can learn from each other? Yeah, we have a we have a products working group that we're going to try and reinvigorate uh, over over the next while. So, even though it it doesn't say users in the title, that the intention is that it, it it's a connection uh, to users and that the products generated are are suitable for user uptake, if you like. Um, we hope potentially to team up with ICES in that regard, the International Council for the Exploration of the Seas. They have a, a working group on operational products for fisheries and ecosystems, and we may well join forces with them. We're already a member of the working group, but we may well join forces. We plan a, a joint session at our annual meeting in, in May where the ICES working group and our products working group get together to um, to really focus on, on some of the next generation user products that we need to develop as a community and then to to pick the individuals, the individual institutes who will develop those products. So it's um, it is a very firm focus of ours to, to do this over the next. Uh, okay, now I'm, I'm happy to ask lots of questions, but uh, I also want to encourage uh, the participants online to type questions if they have them. 
Um, so coming to uh, the, you mentioned that Europe does have quite a complicated landscape, uh, including for funding. W how much of the funding for the actual activities of the Russes and the Eurogoose members comes from the national level, from the European level? Well, the the vast majority of, of the money comes from the member states themselves. So it, it is, um, the, you know, some people have the perception that the European Union funds a, a lot of what happens in operational oceanography in Europe. But actually, the member states, the, I, I wouldn't like to commit to a, an exact percentage, but it's it's certainly north of 70 percent of the money comes from from the member states. Uh, so they are the key to any of these regional systems are the individual member institutes uh, who invest in this and who who make the case at the local level to continue to have the observations sustained. So I would say the split is, is about is about 70, 30 mem member state to European funding. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, at, at, on the European side, it comes from a variety of sources. It comes from the research programs in uh, what was Framework Program 7 is now Horizon 2020. It also comes, in the case of the Copernicus Marine Service, that money comes from DG Growth, which I mentioned earlier on. And um, you also have DG Maritime Affairs, who funds any activity related to blue growth and the development of industry around the uh, around Europe based on the maritime economy. So they fund activity in that area in terms of understanding whether the observing system is fit for purpose. They've, they've sponsored these uh, sea basin checkpoints to to uh, assess the fitness for purpose of the observing system and uh, to answer key societal questions. So they're, um, they're the three main funding areas at, at European level. That's very, very heavily. So uh, you that's mentioned most of the funding is national. Do you think the, the arguments from country to country to uh, sustain that funding are similar or are they really quite specific uh, country by country? I think they are quite 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 specific. I mean, it, 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 when you go when you look around the entire system, um, you know, different ministries that you might not expect to fund certain activities fund certain activities. Um, I, I certainly know that um, a lot of climate observations, for example, in 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 Ireland where I previously worked, were funded from the transport ministry, and uh, so it isn't always the logical connection to say an environment ministry or something like that. Oftentimes they're funded for a different reason for a maritime safety application that ultimately gets used maybe in another context in terms of um, uh, climate observation. So I think th I think the cases even you make for components of a national observing system are are different depending on the type of platform. Um, you know you have then things like tide gauges that are primarily funded by a combination of harbour and port authorities and um, also people who are mandated to forecast coastal flooding and these types of things. So it really depends and it is very specific to the individual uh, countries. I don't think there's any... I guess it would be quite um, um, typical of the heterogeneity of the different kinds of contact points we have in, in oceanography in general. Um, so Jim Baker has a question about whether there's been any private sector engagement on the funding side. Uh, in terms of the private sector being a source of funding, I would say that's been that's been relatively uh, limited for for our our community. But we are beginning to see uh, the uptake of some of the data and some of the products from private industry to then make much more bespoke products for um, very specific users. So you're seeing you're seeing uh, not private industry funding the system, although some people would argue that maybe they should. Uh, but the private sector are certainly starting to make use of the operational products that are available to then turn them into more bespoke products for uh, customers that they have in their own in their own uh, industries. So they're not they haven't so far been a, a major contributor of, of funds to the the uh, ocean observing system. I would say it's primarily still public funds across the system that that does that. Have there been any stories about engaging industry to be Very advocates for funding? Exceptions. Well, uh, actually, in May of last year, we, we brought in our first, uh, uh, I was going to call it a small to medium enterprise, but it's actually a consortium of many uh, Italian companies who, who work in this 
uh, area, and they um, they have they they are now a formal member of of Eurogroup. So we're we're actively trying to reach out to to industry people to see if they can use the products and services that we. Uh, generate on a on an ongoing basis, and we have several events planned at the Oceanology International uh, meeting in March in a couple of weeks' time to engage industry and to make at least make them aware of some of the products that are available through the uh, Copernicus uh, services, so that they can then turn them into into products and generate revenue for for their companies from that. And then I guess you'd hope through that uh, funding model that they would uh, feed back to their politicians and enterprise ministries and so on that. The services that we provide are, are very good, and on that basis, try to sustain the networks. It's uh, it might be a it might be a risky strategy, but we hope it uh, we hope it'll pay off. That as 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 soon as industry starts to uh, make products and services from our from our endeavors, that they at least help us make the case to retain the. So you talked about in your talk the about the link between your goose and global structures, including uh, goose itself. Um, obviously, you're one of uh, a number of regional alliances within uh, the goose, the, the larger goose. Um, so let me just build on, on Katie's question. Do you, as a regional alliance in this connection with goose, do you get the, the guidance, the feedback, and the support you need from the global coordination effort? And what more could be done? Well, in terms of support, I mean, we are an active member of what they call the Goose Regional Alliance Forum. So that's where the Goose Regional Alliances get together on uh, uh, every second year uh, to meet and exchange views. And we have we have taken some actions from the recent uh, Goose Regional Alliance Forum uh, to help neighboring uh, Goose Regional Alliances build capacity. So we, we hope to have some initiatives in the Black Sea. Uh, we hope to have uh, some initiatives perhaps in North Africa um, with uh, with some help from some of the funding programs in, in, in Europe. So in, in that sense, I, I think we're reasonably well connected into, into the Goose uh, system. I'm, I'm not sure Goose itself um, gives due recognition to the, the various GRAs. Um, Goose certainly emphasizes, as I have, the national systems. Um, but the, the GRAs, the Goose Regional Alliances, do sit in between the national systems and the and and the Goose system at, at the global level. And we could probably do with more integration in that sense. And uh, I've just become a, a member of the Goose uh, Steering Committee in the last few months, and I hope I hope to bring some of those views to the Goose Steering Committee and to strengthen the role played by uh, by the Goose Regional Alliances, and also to be more active in some of the expert panels. Um, the, the physics, the biology, and the biogeochemistry panels that uh, that GCOS and Goose have, have have set up. I think our community can can give a lot to that in terms of defining essential ocean variables and so on. So I'm um, I'm optimistic that we can build a much stronger link with, with with the Goose community and that we can also help our neighbouring Goose regional alliances to build capacity that that maybe exists in Europe, but can be transferred to uh, other And we're looking forward to that, uh, uh, to that regions. And it's quite actually interesting when, when I looked at uh, the Eurogo structure with its uh, Ruses, um, there is even some parallel to uh, what we're trying to do with the Goose Regional Alliances and, and Goose itself. I want to come a little bit to maybe the observing network. So you, you have a number of task teams on HF radar, on tide gauges, ferry boxes, gliders, uh, moorings and your Argo. So Argo obviously is a uh, there's a very strong link to the basin scale and the global networks. What about for the for the other task teams? How how is their link? How do they how do they gain from being uh, associated with global networks, and how do they contribute to those global networks? Well, in, in some cases, the the network is is more developed in other places than in Europe. So we have to benefit, and that, and that was one of one of the things that we benefited from in terms of plugging in the HF radar task team to the geo HF radar task team at the global scale. So they had already done a lot of work on standards that we could benefit from at at the European level, and a lot of the recent funding for HF radar activity in Europe is actually. Um, going towards, say, implementing some of the standards that have already been developed at the global level into the European system. Then in other, in other uh, types of observing platform, Europe are actually ahead and they're, they're setting some of the standards. Um, so it, it varies depending on, on, on the platform. And um, so it goes both ways. In some cases, we, we implement stuff that, that comes down from 
from the global system and in other cases we contribute to to uh, the, the standards and the, and the data sharing and, and those various things um, by, by by making standards at, at the European level and then and then feeding that into the into the into the global system so we're we're, we're reasonably active uh, through our task teams and doing that but the they, they have very common terms of reference. It is all about standardization. It is ensuring that if you have, um, you know, 50 radars around the coast of Spain and Portugal, that they, they adopt at least similar or common standards so that a, a user who needs radars from two or three adjacent sites, that they at least are, are comparing like with like and, and there's not big shifts in their interpretation of the data and so on. Um, there, there are some of the issues we want to get around. Similarly, with tide gauges, we want to make sure that uh, you know, sea level means the same thing to the various people involved. Uh, for fixed platforms and for gliders and other platforms, so that we really want to enhance the number of biological measurements that are made on those platforms because they are they are u uniquely capable of making some of these biological measurements. And with a, a platform like Ferrybox, it's it's really about consolidation and also about increasing the number of routes. Um, there's, there's a bit of a north south. Uh, a bias in the number of ferry box routes. There are many concentrated in the north of Europe, not so many in the south. And we'd like to, for example, enhance the ferry box routes in the Mediterranean Sea as well. Um, so we want to enhance some networks. We want to standardize in others. It really depends on the specific platform uh, as to the, the, the type of work that we do. But the terms of reference are quite common. You know, they're standardization, integration, sharing a best practice, uh, sharing a technical capacity and so on. That they're, they're really and, and how are the standards um, published or promulgated? Is there is there um, a Eurogoose uh, standards um, series? Well, not not specifically through Eurogoose itself. Although our data management working group has produced several Eurogoose publications that have also made it into the mainstream uh, literature. Um, so we we don't have a, a standards uh, we don't have a standard series per se, but we have produced say uh, best practice guidelines for the collection of in situ data and the processing of processing of in situ data uh, through the data management and, uh, and and quality assurance working group of Eurogoose. And similarly for you know the technology working group for example will produce a a deliverable this year on precisely what I described in the talk the. Uh, existing technologies that are suitable for operational oceanography, technologies that are likely to come on stream in the next uh, five to ten years that could be implemented in the operational system, and they, they get produced as a as a Eurogoose uh, publication that's available for download from the website and available to the wider. The wider just coming to this technology so working group, um, do they work primarily in the in the space of the observations themselves, or are they also concerned about the uh, technology related to models and products and connections to users? No, it's primarily focused on the technology that measures parameters in the sea. So it's it's really about sensors, platforms, um, and focuses very much on that. And um, the uh, coastal modeling working group would be more likely to uh, embark on the type of work you described there in terms of uh, pri priorities in, in terms of modeling, uh, particularly coastal modeling, downscaling, upscaling, all those kinds of things. They're more within the terms of reference of the coastal modeling uh, working group, COSMO, we call it. Uh, so technology very much focused on the platforms, the sensors, but also uh, in this uh, report that will be produced in the next couple of months, uh, we're also going to have a forward look. We're going to look at things like nanotechnology, anti-fouling technologies to see how, how they're going to impact on our community over the next five to ten years um, to try to bring some of that in and you know particularly things around uh, battery saving you know uh, power saving uh, trying to make uh, autonomous platforms last longer when they're when they're out at sea without in between service visits l looking at issues like power management and telecommunications as well so not just the sensors and platforms but also how the information gets back to shore and how you increase the longevity of okay. the platform. And they must work quite closely with the task teams and focus on the individual platform. Yeah, we certainly do. There's a very good, um, actually a couple of times a year we have um, we have a crossover meetings between the task teams, working groups, and the regional system chairs, and uh, they they all get to tell a little bit about their activities and to look for ways that we can better work together across the 
uh, across the Eurogo system so that we're not working in isolation. So that that's that's quite active now. Um, as I say, we have, two, we have two formal meetings a year that do that, but we also have a lot of interaction in between meetings between Roos chairs and, and task team chairs and so on. So it's uh, that's quite, so quite a... if we move more towards the, the output side of the system, you talked about the three major European initiatives related to data management and data distribution. And um, by the way, thank you for the uh, the pilot project that you have with all the Goose Regional Alliances in terms of assembling and uh, displaying all the data that's available. Um, so we have these three different um, initiatives, Copernicus uh, Instac, CDataNet, eModNet, and you have an integrating role. So how, how does that actually work? Uh, I guess at, at the fundamental level, without without trying to make it sound more complex than it is, it's it's, it's all about people, and it's all about uh, the right people talking to each other. And a lot of the a lot of the work in this integration across the three pillars is, is the work that my my colleague Patrick Garange is involved in, where he he spends an awful lot of time interacting, uh, talking to the various people involved, and trying to get them to see a, a common a common view. One of the ways we do that is through our data management working group, which is chaired by uh, Sylvie Poulikan, who's probably known to many of the people here, um, she has a role as coordinator of the Institutec for Copernicus, but she's also active in 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 CDataNet and she's also active in eModNet. So she has this global view of 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 the whole data system, uh, and she's one of the key people who who help us with this integration task. And then we have to bring the people in from eModNet, uh, both the eModNet secretariat and the individual. Uh, lots the physics, biology, and chemistry lots within within eModnet. Um, our colleagues in eModnet actually asked us to host a session in the eModnet conference in October, where we actually got all the different entities in in the same room. And I, I was asked to chair the session. I thought it would be uh, I thought it would be p potential fireworks uh, when, when when this happened, but it was actually remarkably civilized. And uh, I think the community have have matured a lot over the last five years. Uh, lar largely down to the role that, that Patrick and, and Sylvie and, and people like them have played uh, in, in trying to get the people around the table. We used the data mech then as, as a, a Eurogoose thing, so it isn't seen as being a Copernicus, a Copernicus entity or an, an eModNet entity. It's seen as an integrating entity that, that hopes to get these guys to work together and to look at things like the connectedness between the historical data sets and the real-time data sets. Um, and and to look at at some of the practical ways that the data can be shared between the different uh, initiatives. So in in short, Albert, it's it's down to people, and it's down to um, convincing other people that that uh, we all have a common view that there's a unique uh, customer for each of the different types of uh, initiatives. With CMEMs very focused on the operational users, with eModnet very focused on uh, sectoral users who are trying to develop new companies and new ideas based on blue growth. Uh, and on the CDataNet side, it's much more the scientific community, the, the climate type applications, but also uh, a lot of the industry use the historical data sets to plan activity, things like siting of wind farms, siting of aquaculture sites. They rely very heavily on the, on the long term time series uh, to plan activities, to plan investment in some of the major uh, spheres of investment in the maritime space. So um, it's, really, it's really down to people and it's really down to getting those people talking together and working for uh working it's, for it's definitely a tough I job that's let me ask a question from uh helen uh you described your strategy the yoga strategy for 2014 2020 uh, and also that you have an implementation plan and annual work plans are those for all of your goose or are there are specific and uh, individual work plans for each of the five regional ocean observing systems yeah it's, it's a very good question helen um we 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 try we try to compile the implementation plan and the annual work plan at a at a central level to begin with, and then we we subset that and we give it out to the the regional system chairs, the working group chairs, the task team chairs, for their inputs in terms of uh, while while we keep in very good contact with all of our ruses and task teams, we may not have our finger completely on the pulse in terms of what's achievable within one of those systems and within an individual annual work plan. Um, so we we give our our chairs uh, and their colleagues in the various regional systems we give them an opportunity uh, to to input to those work plans to um, challenge some of the assumptions that we have in the work plans and then we agree on a final work plan usually around this time of the year and then we we spend the remainder of the year trying to implement what's in the 
the work plans after the owners are assigned to the various tasks. So it is it is a shared endeavor. It's not it's not um it's not a top down thing where the office decrees that certain things must happen and and uh, we we put our feet up on the table and wait for wait for the activity to be reported back. We're very active in this process and. Uh, Again, Patrick and my, my colleague Vicente Fernandez and Dina Eparquina, who work in the office here, are very active in, in making sure that the Russes and the task teams have the support they need to deliver the work plans. Uh, so we're, we're in constant contact with these guys. It's not a, we're not uh, separated from them in any way. We, we work with them every day. So well, let me wrap up with one, one last question. Uh, very early on in your talk, you mentioned that uh, one of the things that Jurgis tries to do is engage young researchers. Can you tell us uh, some of the types of activities you do to, to do that? Sure. I mean, I guess our flagship activity in that regard is uh, the uh, most people here are probably aware that our, our previous Secretary General, Costas Nidis, passed away uh, two years ago. And in his memory, we set up a Young Researchers Award, a European Young Researchers Award. Uh, and we awarded that to a Spanish researcher last year. And we just opened uh, calls for uh, the 2016 Costas Nidis Medal uh, recipient or at least the competition for that uh, it, go, it goes out to evaluation and then that uh, young researcher uh, will is given a, a stipend of, of about three thousand euros to uh, to progress their career in some way by attending a key conference or by uh, networking with a particular institute or, or um, lab that they have identified as being critical to their uh, success as, as a researcher so that's one way we do it and um, the, the other way we do it is through the ruses and task teams we um, um, we, we try to encourage young representation on on the ruses and task teams and and we, by and large we, we achieve that we have lots of young researchers who uh, are allowed to sit in on task team meetings and working group meetings and so on uh, so we try to encourage it uh, in in that way. We're also very interested in, in in building capacity in the adjacent GRAs. So we're looking at things like fellowships with colleagues in France and in the European Commission. And Albert and I have discussed this a bit in terms of how we might roll this out in Africa and other places uh, to try and get um, a, a group of fellowships funded by uh, some centralized source in the European Commission or elsewhere to develop operational oceanographic researchers or uh, oceanographers in general um, through some of these fellowships and by putting some of these people in some of the the, the labs, the member labs of our organizations to uh, to get them the experience they need to to grow their careers. So that's really how we how we approach the uh, young researchers um, in, in our community. We try and be as inclusive as we possibly can uh, and to and to give them roles of responsibility when we when we feel they're 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 ready to take on such roles. Thanks very much, Glenn. That's we've we've run out of time, unfortunately, but thank you to you. Uh, thank you for sharing this hour with us on Eurogoose, and thanks to all the audience members that participated. And I'll just remind everyone that the next webinar is on the 14th of March, and we'll hear about another uh, European-led but pan-Atlantic uh, project called Atlantos. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks, Albert.